So immunochemical techniques. What for immunochemical techniques in the lab, we're going to use what's known as reagent antibodies. Why are they reagent antibodies? Because they're specifically prepared for those tests. Yeah, they're specifically prepared antibodies that we use as reagents for tests. Right? How do we prepare antibodies? Science. Science. So we can prepare them in, in animals. Rabbits, goats, sheep, and rats, etc. Or foreign proteins, when we inject them in these animals, will stimulate the B lymphocytes. So, so, and those will start to produce antibodies. So what you can do is you can take a rabbit with the antigen that you want to produce antibodies against. You inject that antigen into the rabbit. Typically, you're going to add what's known as adjuvant. Anybody know what adjuvant is? Yeah, it's going to make that antibody reaction stronger. A lot of times, the adjuvant might be just lipopolysaccharide or something like that. So you inject this antigen into the rabbit. With the adjuvant, it's going to cause an immune response to that an antigen. And that rabbit's going to start making antibodies. Then you just collect the rabbit serum. And you use that serum as your antibody. So, so what's, what kind of antibody would that be? That's typically. Uh, it's got a certain name to it. That's very different than the ones that are typically made in mice. But the ones that made, are made in mice, there's a whole different process to making them. So, because we're collecting it from the whole animal, there's more than one B cell producing antibodies against that antigen, right? So that makes it a polyclonal antibody. Does that make sense? So it's a big thing you need to be able to discriminate between the polyclonal and the monoclonal antibodies. So those antigens have epitopes on them. You have major antigenic determinants or minor antigenic determinants. But the, 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 they're just a piece of that antigen will be the epitope that the antibody recognizes or that it'll bind to, right? And then. Like we just said, polyclonal antibodies you have many different colonies of B cells producing antibodies. So they're, they're antibodies that recognize many different epitopes on the antigen that you're making because you have multiple cells producing those antigens. Whereas monoclonal antibodies are a whole different beast. You start off the same way. You're going to immunize, inject a mouse with the antigen, but then that poor mouse you're going to, you're going to, you know, kind of take his spleen out. <laughs> Retrieve the spleen cells from the, from, from, from the mouse, and then you're going to fuse those spleen cells with an immortalized myeloma cell line that's sensitive to HAT. And these retrieved spleen cells, you're going to impart HAT resistance. You fuse the cells, you're going to grow the fused cells in a medium that contains HAT, which is like a selection medium. And then the unfused cells will die. So now you have these cells that are immortalized because they contain you know, the cancer cells. But then they also contain the, the cells that are producing the antibody against the antigen that you immunize the mouse with. You, so you take the few cells that survive. You dilute them way down to a point you have typically you're going to use a 96 well plate. And you count the number of cells you've, that are alive here. And you calculate what kind of dilution factor you're going to need so you only have a chance, so you only have the likelihood that you're plating one cell per well. Okay? And that one cell becomes your monoclone. It's one clone, right? That's producing antibodies. So you grow those up, and then you test the supernatant for the presence of antibody that reacts to the antigen you originally injected the mouse with. And when they're positive, for the desired cells, you can take that, that cell line. In this case, it's AB3 is positive for the, the antigen. And then you can take that and just continuously grow that monoclonal antibody from that cell line. And it's monoclonal because it came from one B cell. It recognizes one epitope. It's very specific. So, OK.
So selection, so antibody, the amount of specific antibody present is termed the titer. It's basically the concentration of antibody is also termed like the titer. Not all immunoglobulins in antiseria is reactive for a specific antigen. So if you have like the antiseria from a, a rabbit that we're producing an, antigen, uh, an antibody in, there will be other antibodies in there that aren't specific towards your antigen, right? And then the titer is the reciprocal of the maximum dilution of the antibody that gives a detectable reaction for a specific method. So, so a lot of times when you buy antibodies, they, they tell you like one to 1,000 dilution to, to use this and so forth. The affinity is what? That's basically a measure of the strength of the binding between the antibody and the ant, or no, the antigen. I need to fix my spelling, it's bad. <laughs> so smaller KD values equal higher affinity. Can anybody tell me what the KD is? Yes? <laughs> Somebody else then. Jenny, what do you think the KD is? And that D should be subscript. It's, 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 it's not. Huh? Oh, that, I didn't mean Jenny. I meant Melissa. Melissa? <laughs> yes. What do you mean by ratio? Like, so if we, if we just go back to general chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. You've heard of equilibrium, mm -hmm. disassociation, not rate constants, but an equilibrium constant, right? So you have, so A plus B is an equilibrium and it forms A, B, right? So the association equilibrium, which some people see it as Ka, it's going to be equal to the concentration of what? The products over the reactants, right? And that's an equilibrium. Now I could go into the whole thing deriving, you know, you look at the rate equations, and then when the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate, you know, you can set those two rate equations equal to each other, and then you put all the constants on one side, which turns out to be the, the equilibrium con constant, and then the, the equation. So this is the association, the, the equilibrium constant. The disassociation is the reverse of that, right? So we have the KD equals, and that's concentration of A, Right? So <clears throat> here it says the smaller KD values have a higher affinity. So smaller KD values means at equilibrium, more of A and B are bound together than free A and B, right? So the bigger the number in the, in the denominator, the smaller the overall number. So, does that make sense? So that's why when you see KDs with really small numbers, it means it has a really high affinity. Okay, so, and larger KD values has a lower affinity. Disassociation equilibrium constant, right. Specificity is the ability of an antibody to restrict its reaction to a defined group of molecules. So it's important in immunoassays that are used to detect small molecules such as drugs and hormones. Right? Because if otherwise, what's it called? When you don't have the specificity you need, the antibodies will do what with something else? Anybody tell me? One, one reaction uh, example, I think is it, was it the, the joxin maybe? An immunoassay for the joxin will cross, well, oh, I said it, shoot cross-react with caffeine, <laughs> okay? And residual reactions can occur between related molecules and that's cross-reactivity. So if the antibody's not super specific, you get cross-reactivity and that, that can give you false positives or throw off what, what you know, 
the ah, quantification. So antigen as an analyte. So we just talked about using antibodies as analytes or, or as, as reagents. Now we're looking at the antigen as the analyte. These antigens can include proteins, glycoproteins, lipoproteins, small molecules, and hormones. H how are small molecules, what are they called when you can generate an antibody against the small molecule? Anybody know the term for that? If you had immunology, you should know it. Because typically small molecules aren't big enough to generate an immune response to. So how do they do that, do you know? No, no, no. So for small molecules, when you want to generate an antibody to a small molecule, you, you covalently bound, bind it to a large molecule and then immunize with that and then you select antibodies that will specifically bind to that small molecule. And these small molecules are known as haptins. You've heard that term before? So the small molecules are haptins. So antigens are subject to degradation in the biological fluids, right? Especially if they're proteins, glycoproteins, lipoproteins, and hormones. There's enzymes that will degrade those. Temperature can affect, you know, your, your degradation of antigens. Enzymes will too, right? I mean, if you're looking at proteins, proteases will chew those proteins up, and they're proteases in biological fluids. pHs will also. How's pH going to affect your, your antigens? It not only will affect you know, the stability of the antigen, the shape of the antigen, but it will also affect the interaction with that antigen and the antigen binding site on the antibody because you're going to alter charges there, right? So. so there's two different types of quantification, right? We have immunological quantification and biological quantification. So when we detect with antibodies, does that mean that, what we're, that antigen that we're de 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 detecting <laughs> is biologically active. Does it? So there could be, like for an example, can anybody tell me about trypsin or chromotrypsin? No, you can't tell me about trypsin or chromotrypsin? What is trypsin and chromotrypsin? It's an enzyme, right? And it's a class of enzyme known as zymogens. Does anybody remember what a zymogen is? Yeah, so it's an enzyme that needs proteolytic cleavage to become active. So if you have a zymogen, that protein the amino acid sequence is the same whether, you know, let's say this is chromotrypsin. It's going to have to be cleaved, let's say, here and here. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but there's several places where it gets cleaved. If you have an antibody that recognizes the active portion of the, the chromo... Oh, this is terrible artwork. <laughs> the active portion of chromotrypsin, there's a good chance it will recognize that same part of the chromotrypsinogen, right? And the chromotrypsinogen is the inactive zymogen of chromotrypsin. So just because you can detect it with antibodies and quantify it with antibodies doesn't mean it's biologically active. That's where your biological quantitation would come from some activi activity assay of chromotrypsin rather than uh, immunoassay where you're just measuring it with an antibody. So you want to be clear that Antibodies can tell you if that antigen's there, it tells you nothing about its activity. Likewise, this is the case where proteases activate it. You can also have a lot of enzyme or some antigen in the serum that can be inactivated by proteases, but you'd still be able to detect the piece with an antibody, right? So just because the antibody binds to it doesn't mean that that molecule is active. Sound good? So, so antigen antibody binding, there's three major contributing forces. These are just your general chemistry stuff, right? Electrostatic, uh, 
Vanderwaals London dipole and Vanderwaals London forces and then dipole dipole interactions. Your normal general chi chemistry intermolecular forces are going to hold those antigen antibody binding together. You have hydrophobic interactions and ionic columbic bonding primarily between carboxylic acid and amine groups on the antigen and the antibody. And then I like this, so this is not from our book, from a different book. Maybe that shouldn't be on camera either. <laughs> but this, this shows us the precipitin reaction. Has anybody ever heard of that as far as in, in, in immunological reactions go? What happens if you have the right amount of antibody and the right about of antigen, if these two are optimized, you'll get insoluble pro complexes formed. You see antibodies have two antigen binding sites, right? So you can form bridges between antigen and form these large complexes that are somewhat insoluble and you'll be able to see them, okay? And the concentration that you have of antibody versus antigen, there's only a sweet spot where you form these precipitin or precipitin reactions. So if you have too much antibody, you'll form soluble complexes only with the, you know, the antibody and the antigen. Too little antibody, again, you'll form soluble complexes. So when you're doing an assay, you need to be in this sweet range where you form those precipitin con concentrations. So, and this is, goes into a, like a, a qualitative method for measuring antigen or antibody concentrations in serum or some biological fluid. And this could be passive gel immunodiffusion. We'll see these precipitin reactions. Immunoelectrophoresis is another type of assay and then Western blocking. And this is our passive gel electrophoresis. Not, 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 but I can't talk. Passive um, gel diffusion. <laughs> Sorry. So in this technique, you have these three little wells and some kind of agar or agros that contain either the antigen or antibody that you're interested in. So you're going to have an antibody in one and antigens in the other. And you can see, like, if you're looking to test a patient's sample of serum to see if they have an antibody towards a specific disease type, you put the different disease, you can put a control antigen here and then a, a diseased, like, hepatitis C antigen in this one. And then you run the reaction and you see where you get the precipitin line, right? So in this case, you have a precipitin line here. So you have antigen antibody complexes form this precipitin line. And in this case, we have antigen one antibody one here. So you can, you know, form these lines and determine qualitatively if this antibody or the antigens are present in the samples, depending on how you're testing it. Does that make sense? And then this is a picture of what those really look like. I don't know if it's that good rather than just the cartoon showing, showing you. Then another method is this immunoelectrophoresis. And these, this is used, again, you punch holes in the agar. And <clears throat> you're going to electrophorese the samples. And then you have antibodies, I think, in the, in the wells that you add afterwards, and then those diffuse, and you, you can separate, and you'll see the precipitin lines again, and be able to tell whether it's got that antibody in the sample for the antigens that you were looking for. And this is two-dimensional crossed immunoelectrophoresis. And you separate one dimension, and then in this case, after you take the first dimension, you separate it a second dimension, dimension where the antibody containing gel. So you have antibody within this gel. And then you'll be able to see those precipitin lines for the antigen where it gets separated in that first dimension. And this is a real life version of that. So this is what we separated. And this is trypsin. So crossed immunoelectrophoresis pattern obtained with two different concentrations of trypsin. And you get these 
bumps where you get the trips in. So you separated it this way, and then you get the trips in reaction. And then another example is this counter immunoelectrophoresis showing the positive reaction between hemophilus influence of B in the upper chamber and cerebral spinal fluid sample containing the H in the lower chamber. So you get a zone of, so you have the antibody well here, so you have anti-hemophilus B up here, then you take a pa patient sample with cerebral spinal fluid and you get that precipitin reaction tells you that the patient's cerebral spinal fluid has the hemophilus influenza B in the, in the brain. So that, that could be a bad thing, right? Next, we've all seen immunofixation or Western blotting. And we know it's a three-stage process. First, you're going to separate via electrophoresis. Then you blot to that solid support, which is typically going to be PVDF membranes or nitrocellulose membrane. And then you're going to probe it with an antibody that's specifically going to recognize the antigen you're interested in and visualize it either enzymatically or with film if you're using radiation. Or really you don't even need the radiation for the film if you have a chemoluminescent reaction that's you know, bound to the antibody. So we already talked about this a little. Why do we use the SDS? It's an anionic detergent. Before the SDS, that protein's gonna have its three-dimensional structure. After the SDS, it linearizes that three-dimensional structure and coats it with a net amount of negative charge that's going to be based on that amino acid length. It's typically going to be based on that amino acid length of that protein. And then when we separate it through the gel, again, the polyacrylamide gel has tunnels of different diameters. The larger proteins will be held back and they'll flow slow, slower Faster molecules will be held, be, be flow faster, migrate faster, and we'll see a Western blot that looks like this or that, depending on if you're drawing the Western blot or actually taking a picture. Actually, this doesn't even look like a Western blot to me. It looks, looks almost like a page or a, a Kumasi gel. This is a gel stained with Kumasi. So this is the overall process, SDS page with the proteins you're interested in, separate them by molecular weight, blot to a nitrocellulose or PVDF membrane, label it with an antibody that has some sort of device on the antibody that you can generate some kind of signal that you can visualize. So. So for quantitative immunomethods, one type is the radial diffusion and electroimmunoassays. And also we can talk about turbometric and nephilometric assays, which we talked a little bit about last time, right? Or the time before. It was on the test. And labeled immunochemical assays. So this is your radial immunodiffusion where you can generate a standard curve based on how far that antigen diffuses out of the, the gel into a gel containing the, the antibody. So you have antibody in the gel, concentration of antigen. You have a known, an, you know, if you have antigen available as a standard, you can generate a standard curve. You measure the, the radius from the standards, and then you can ma measure the radius from an unknown sample and plot it against the line and estimate the concentration of that antigen in your sample, right? Other quantitative method is this. It's a rocket immunoelectrophoresis, where you electrophoresis into a gel that has antibody. And again, your calibrators, increasing amounts of antigen. And then you compare it to duplicated samples in this case, they're duplicate samples, and you measure the peak height of those rockets and that will tell you, you know, how much antigen is in those samples, right? 
And we have immunonephilometry, where that antibody and antigen bind, you'll form complexes, that precipitin reaction, right? If you have complexes that are large enough, they'll scatter the light, okay? And there's a direct relationship between the intensity of scattered light and the amount of precipitate formed and the concentration of that antigen. So, it's <coughs> In this case, the antigen or the antibody must be in excess. Why does the antibody have to be in excess in this case, in immunonephilometry? Because if your antigen's in excess, it will saturate all the antibodies and you'll have more antigen that you won't be able to, to measure. Does that make sense? So the antibody could be in excess, but not an antigen. Right. So some of the pitfalls in nephilometry is the antibodies not in excess. Your background scatter is too high. What might cause the background scatter to be too high of, of a sample? I think I talked about this in biochem the other day, not, not clinical chems. Other proteins? If you have large proteins that are going to scatter the light. But what else? What else might you see in a serum sample that will scatter the light? How about chylomicrons or, or, or VLDLs? Those are big enough to scatter the light. So that would be your background scatter. If you have a sample with too many lipids, it'll look milky. It's going to scatter a lot of light, and you won't be able to do this immunonephilometry unless you seriously dilute the sample down. Interference is caused by a colored solution. That could be hemolysis can cause that to be colored, right? Poor mixing. Immune complexes are already present in the serum. So if you already have immune complexes in the serum, that antig antigenic sites might be tied up already. So there's also a nephilometric inhibition assay, and that's where you have a small molecules covalently bound to the large carrier molecule. And this is more common than your general nephilometric assay. Free antigen molecules compete for this antibody bi binding. So the decrease in signal in a concentration dependent manner. So do you, do you see what's going on here? So one of your reagents is a large molecule with antigens bound to it, right, in multiple places. Okay, so it's going to compete for that antibody with the free antigens. So this and this will complete, com compete. The more free antigen you have, the less, you know, of these large complexes that will form between the antibody and these particles with the antigen covalently bound. So the less antigen you have, the more complexes you have, the more light scatter you'll get. So you'll get a lot of light scatter. As you add free antigen, okay, that light scatter goes down because the free antigen is going to take these an an antigen binding sites on the antibody and not allow the, the antibodies to form cross-linked particles large enough to scatter the light. And in this case, this is a, the Joxin assay where they have the Joxin labeled particles that scatter the light. As you, the sample, as you, as you have more and more free to Joxin, that lowers the amount of light scattered, you know, that relates perfectly to the concentra concentration of the free to Joxin. So you can measure a small molecule in the serum that way with an easy assay. Have you guys done agglutination assays yet in hematology? Or? No? Soon, soon, maybe? Wasn't that um, blood taping as well? Huh? Isn't that kind of like blood taping? Yeah, blood taping yeah. relies on an agglutination assay, but that's an agglutination where you're agglutinizing the, the whole cells. There's even, in pathogenic micro, you can identify the subtypes of strep. There's a test that I did, you know, 
when my family was sick, I identified what strep it was. <laughs> Where there's vinyl beads with the, that, that 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 can identify, and it's it's just, you know, basically an agglutination reaction also. So, anyways, that's where you get clumping and sedimentation of the antigen following the reaction with the antibody. It depends on the formation of the antibody bridges between bi or multivalent antibodies and antigenic particles with multiple antigenic determinants. So what we're saying, multiple, so you have antigenic particles with multiple antigenic determinants. That means it has the same antigen all over it, so you can get multiple antibodies binding to it and forming these large cross bridges. Does that make sense? Examples of multiple, things with multiple antigenic determinants could be viruses or bacteria. If they have the same protein coat on the outside of them, multiple antibodies can bind to that. And then those antibodies, if they're multivalent, will be able to bind multiple, multiple particles and you'll have these large complexes that are able to form. So different, so multivalent complex antibodies will be more likely to form a glutination reaction than just bivalent, right? So this would be IgG, right? What, what's an example of a multivalent antibody? IgM. Yeah, IgM. Exactly. So IgM would be better at agglutination assays than just IB, IgG. Does that make sense? And then, yeah. Factors affecting agglutination reactions include particle charges. So your red blood cells, bacteria, latex, all have a net negative charge. So when you're trying to agglutinate them together, you're trying to force those negative charges to get close to each other, and that has to be overcome somehow. Antibody type, this is yeah, what I just talked about, right? IgM is better than IgG, and why is that? Because there's more antigenic binding sites on an IgM molecule than there is an IgG molecule. Electrolyte concentrations is gonna help with that negative surface charge of the particles. The more electrolytes, the more likely you will be to get to form those complexes. And then the antigenic determinants, multiple antigenic determinants are necessary for agglutination. So if, you, if, if, you're, if you're testing an antigen that you're only going to find one on, on one particle that you're testing for, you're never going to get agglutination because you're not going to be able to form another antibody. It's not going to be able to bind it and form a cross bridge. You need multiple antigenic determinants. Concentration, temperature, and time all can affect agglutination also, that how fast things will come together or come apart. So direct agglutination we use to diagnose microbial infections and type human red blood cells. It's very simple, where you, know, you just directly form those agglutinized particles. Or you could have indirect agglutination, where you have a carrier red blood cell or a latex bead that you're going to add the antigen to and then you'll see if you have pre presence of that antigen by forming this agglutination. So it's passive or indirect agglutination. Or you could have agglutination inhibition. You have a soluble antigen in your sample, you mix it with the antibody, you form these antigen antibody complexes, then you have the antigen coated carrier you're not going to be able to form that agglutination reaction if you have a lot of this in your sample, right? Makes sense? So it's like similar to that um, uh, 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 immunoinhibition and nephil... Ah, I, can't, ah, I can't talk. Back here. Nephilometric inhibition immunoassay. <laughs> Same kind of idea, but instead of looking at nephilometry, you're, you're seeing it with your eye the agglutination. The antibody, antiglobulin testing you can do with agglutination. And this is a direct Combs test. Have you heard of that before in hematology or immunology? I don't know where you learned this. Yeah, so you have this negative cloud of charge, which is going to be hard to form this agglutination reaction between these because the, the charge is so great. But you have Combs reagent, which is an anti-IgG IgG, that will be able to cross bridge those and you'll be able to get the agglutination between them.
And then the indirect Combs test, so you have a patient, you have a series of red blood cells of different antigenic types, plus a patient serum with unknown antibody. This is how we find out what antibodies the patient has. You mix it with the red cell A and red cell B, coats with the antibody, then the IgG. Red cell A does not agglutinate, but red cell B will agglutinate, so you can identify you know, the patient has an antibody towards red cell B. And I think you probably do these experiments in the immunohematology class. So. Complement fixation assays. So it's important to, in diagnosis of fungal, viral, and parasitic infections, quantifying complement levels. Complement proteins are activated in sequence after antigen antibody reactions, right? This is way back from immunology, if you can remember immunology. So you can do like one stage testing where you have a red blood cell, hemolysin, which is an anti-red blood cell antibody. You sensitize that red blood cell with the hemolysin at a complement source and then you can measure the amount of hemolysis that occurs via the, the hemoglobin concentrations. Or two-stage testing where you have an unknown antibody, you mix it with antigen and complement, and then the antigen antibody complex which activates the complement and the sensitized red blood cell indicator cells. If you get inhibition of lysis prior to activation of the complement, then the unknown antibody is therefore specific for that antigen used. So, but if you don't get inhibition, you'll see the hemolysis and then it's not the same antigen as the antibody. So. And then of course, immunoassays. So the labels applied to the antibodies or antigens allow for enhanced sensitivity and we can label these antigens or antibodies with enzymes fluorescent or chem chemoluminescent molecules and radioisotopes are going to be the most sensitive. There's several types of immunoassays, competitive, non-competitive, homogeneous and or heterogeneous. Homogeneous or heterogeneous immunoassays. So this is your typical sandwich ELISA assay, which now in proteins class, this is what we have you make a sandwich ELISA, a sandwich ELISA. Before, it was a direct ELISA. Now we do a, a sandwich ELISA. First, we coat the solid surface. We use a 96 well plate, coat it with an antibody that's going to bind to the antigen that we're interested in. We wash off the excess coatings and we got a block in this step too. They don't, they don't show you the blocking steps. But the blocking steps are because antigens and antibodies are, are proteins. They like to stick to this polystyrene. You're going to block it with a, a, an anti, with a protein such as that you're not interested in such as BSA. Then you put your, your uh, antigen in there with a mobilized antibody and the antigen is going to bind to that immobilized antibody. You wash off the excess again. Then you're going to probe it with a secondary antibody that has some sort of visualizing agent such as an enzyme, fluorescent molecule, radio tag or something. Normally we just use enzymes which is where it gets the name enzyme immunoassay. So <clears throat> The, the secondary antibody with the enzyme is going to bind the, the antigen or the protein you're interested in. And it should be a different antigenic determinant. So it can, right, like if it's a protein, you want the, the, the capture antibody and detection antibody to, to be able to identify, be able to bind to different parts of that protein. Otherwise, if they're binding to the same part, they're all tied up here in this step, right? Then after we wash that excess off, you react the enzyme with a specific substrate that will generate the color or, or luminescence or fluorescence as a product. And then you can measure the amount of that that's produced and the amount of color or chemoluminescence detected is going to be related to the concentration of the antigen in your sample. So this 
This step here is actually what they use to detect HIV antibody. They're screened for HIV antibody in, in a patient sample. They, they, you can buy an ELISA kit that has the wells coated with HIV protein. You wash that off and then you treat it with the patient sample that's going to contain antibodies. If they have HIV or hepatitis C antibody, it'll bind to the, the antigen that's coated on the wells. Wash again, then you hit it with an anti-human IgG antibody that's going to recognize human IgGs and that's labeled with an enzyme. Wash that again and then you react it with the substrate to produce a colored product. And you can det determine if that patient's sample has antibodies against the antigen you're, to see if they've been exposed to pathogen. Next step is the solid, what is this, enzyme immunoassay competitive binding. So a competitive immunoassay, what we do is we, again, coat the plate with an antibody against the antigen we're interested in, wash. You're going to add patient sample containing an antigen plus an enzyme labeled antigen. So in this case, the patient's antigen is competing with the antigen that's labeled. This is a reagent antigen that's labeled with an enzyme. The more patient antigen present, the less enzyme labeled antigen will be attached to the antibodies coated on the wells. Wash again, react with the product, or we react with the substrate to produce a colored product, and the product may, is measured as a color change. So in this case, if you get a lot of signal, does the patient have a lot of antigen in their blood? If you have a lot of signal at the end, does the patient's blood have antigen? No, because the reagent antigen has labeled the enzyme. So the more color you get, the more this is bound, meaning the less patient sample, the less antigen in the patient sample. Does that make sense? We, we did one of these for this class a couple semesters ago, measuring cortisol and saliva. Because they have cortisol labeled with the HRP that we compete with the cortisol in our saliva. It worked pretty well. Maybe we'll do that again in the future. Not this semester, sorry. Not stressed out. Huh? Not stressed out. Yeah, yeah, that's what, what we could do is try to take, take saliva samples right before an exam and right after exam. <laughs> see stress levels before and after, right? That would be cool. And then these are some, some things you gotta be concerned about that are gonna interfere with immunoassays. Have you ever heard of heterophilic antibodies? One of the most common ones are these Hamas, Hamas, and we don't mean the you know, Palestinian group, Hamas. These Hamas, I think human anti-mouse antibodies. So if, if a patient's been treated with a monoclonal antibody or if they, before, they're going to develop antibodies against mouse antibodies. And if they have anti-mouse antibodies in their serum, those anti-mouse antibodies in their serum is going to react with a lot of the monoclonal antibodies that are used in these tests. So it's going to interfere. So components in the sample that can link the solid phase antibody with the label will be measured as if it is an analyte. So these will interfere with these assays. So you want to look at patient history to see if they might have a chance of having Hamas. So, and then 